No, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ketevi, for, for reaching out to, to us regarding this um, ASP online uh, seminars. Uh, we think they are very, very important a set of seminars. Um, we've had an opportunity to attend the ASP conference in, in Namibia. Uh, you'll recall that I actually drove a thousand kilometers from Haborone uh, to Vinduk just for the pleasure of uh, attending what I thought was an instrumental conference that <clears throat> that rotates around Africa. And I think it was, it was a great success um, given that there was a very good mix of, of, of the physics, uh, the science and the teaching uh, and the interactions that happened there. So it's really a great pleasure to, to come back again to interact with your, with your audience. So, so as, as, as highlighted, um, the presentation is a set of presentations. Um, we are very, very grateful to, to have had positive responses from three colleagues who are really, really, really instrumental in all the things that are covered in that topic. Um, you recall that um, we have ongoing initiatives obviously across Africa, um, also in Southern Africa, regarding the issue of developing our capacity as Africans to, to, to participate in the science enterprise. So, so I'm very, very glad to, to have uh, Dr. Happy Sitole, uh, that, that you've met uh, Dr. Ketebi. Uh, Happy is the, is, the, is the manager for the South African uh, National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure System. Uh, he'll have a long presentation um, that, that we, I hope will really highlight uh, the strides that um, South Africa is making, but also the collaborations that they are leading in the region regarding uh, capacitating uh, uh, regional member states uh, in these areas. I'm also uh, very grateful to have uh, Dr. Simon Hodson, who is the Executive Director of Core Data under the International Science Council. Uh, Dr. Hodson has also, also been very, very active in, in this area of data especially engaging uh, us. Um, you recall that uh, the International Data Week conference, uh, the, the second ever International Data Week conference and the Sci Data Con were held in Africa in Botswana in 2018. Uh, really just through the work of, um, of organizations like Core Data, organizations like WDS and RDA, joining hands with us Africans to host this uh, event for the world. So Dr. Hudson will, will share a lot about Core Data uh, its activities can also highlight, obviously, uh, issues of open science and open data. And I'm also very grateful to have, very last minute, um, also invited uh, Dr. Merjane Gopapi uh, from the South African Weather Service. Um, we've invited her primarily because she's really doing a great job uh, leading uh, the work that is done by meteorological services in Southern Africa. Uh, this really to collaborate in and around a project that would exercise uh, the infrastructure that Dr. Sitter will talk about, but also enhance uh, our collaborations in the region. As, as an example of a scientific project uh, that could be done and enhanced uh, using, using the cyber infrastructure. So Dr. Ketevi, I don't know how much time we have in total uh, so that we can schedule these presentations well and, and, yes, and make think, the best time. Yeah, we have uh, an hour and a half total. Uh, we can go over by 30 minutes. I see that we have... Uh, a lot of good uh, material from all of you guys are uh, really it's very nice uh, we, yes. should have, we should have arranged for you know maybe a series of presentation but uh, today we have up to two hours and then we can arrange uh, you know other other talks later on yes that's what i thought so i think we add on the side of caution so that at least at the worst case scenario we leave the material with the with the audience for them to interrogate at their own time um, I think I think without further ado, maybe let's let's continue. Uh, Dr. Ketel, you set a very uh, uh, um, you set a very good example last time regarding what you wanted for us to introduce ourselves. So I actually got two set of slides. Uh, let me project the ones that actually had some introductions that that you required. Give me one second. Dr. Ketegu wanted us to introduce ourselves, to make ourselves human, more African. So, so he actually done a great job last time explaining to us um, his origins, uh, where he came from in terms of his family, having immigrated to another country 
uh, uh, also, and eventually uh, 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 meeting up uh, generations later. So I do, I do have uh, some slides to match yours, uh, Dr. Ketebi. Uh, I'll project those uh, compared to the ones that I have given you to 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 submit to submit online. Just give me one second there. Okay, I think this is the right version. Okay. So, so the topic is as follows. Um, we wish for this seminar series, colleagues, uh, let me welcome also the, the, the number of delegates uh, from the ASP community uh, who made, made an effort to come. I think uh, we really should be doing more of these across disciplines. So I really applaud Dr. Ketebi and his team uh, for really setting these, uh, these seminars together uh, uh, going forward. So we do want to talk a little bit about what is happening in the African cyber infrastructure. We'll talk about what the cyber infrastructure is, and we also highlight that we discussed areas of open science and open data, and maybe how the cyber infrastructure and open data and open science can, can really push and move Africa forward. So a little bit about myself, Dr. Kitevi. Um, this is this, this supposed to, to, to rival the, your very good introductory slides you've done last time, uh, just to humanize ourselves and to Africanize ourselves. Um, so, so, so I come from Botswana. I'll talk about Botswana in a minute. Um, I highlight the uh, one or two generations uh, of the family I come from. Uh, my grandfather uh, ably served in the Second World War. Um, we've, we've had very great pleasure of having him for 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 a good number of years. I think I was he was just an old man even when I was born, because he died at the age of I think about 105. Uh, there is him in Sicily, I believe, in 1942, 43, or something like that, towards the end of the war. Um, he's always, always uh, provided, I think, a window to our past. And he's the one person who ably talked about uh, going to Europe uh, to us when he was, when we were young. And we used to recollect uh, the stories that he shared with us about how advanced the uh, European continents are. And he, he, he went to his grave, believing that as Africans, we will never catch up. Uh, with Europe, and I always uh, had very heated debates with him about, look, uh, I think we can do it, uh, and, and I have gone to European countries. I think it's a matter of effort, it's a matter of investment, it's a matter of attitude. So we need to have very, very long discussions about the world and everything else. I'm also showing there my father, who is a disciplined police officer. He's retired at the age of 65. Uh, he retired assistant commissioner. He served this country very, very, very well. He served about four presidents of this country. You can see him at the top right corner there uh, presenting a, a letter uh, to the first president of Botswana, which is a tradition. Uh, really, one of the officers was picked to provide uh, a letter uh, to the HE on occasion of some events. I'm um, talking about this because I think through this heritage, we see how Botswana got independence, how we progressed to where we are through the able leadership, but also uh, the dedication of Botswana through uh, people like our fathers and our grandfathers. Uh, you also see there my family uh, at, at the very bottom. You see there my brothers. And you see me when I was very young in London uh, going to study for my undergrad. I left Botswana in 1996 and came back home in 2011. That's about 17 years. Uh, during that time, uh, obviously, I learned a lot about both uh, the European continent and the way things are done, but also coming back home to try to serve. You can see there at the bottom right corner, uh, I have spent some time uh, trying to do exactly that. So the next set of slides shows what I'm engaged in. Um, obviously, my core business is at the university as an academic, as a researcher, uh, as a mentor for students, but I also provide national service. I try to serve in various national uh, 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 platforms. Uh, I'm involved in the task team for the space science strategy. I mention this because we've got a set of audiences here who are, who are scientists. Maybe some of them are astronomers. Some of them are astrophysicists. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for us as scientists to participate in national discussions and in national fora and in policy making fora for, so that the scientific voice uh, can always be heard and represent well. I also represent in committees regarding Botswana's engagement uh, in the SKA, uh, which is what Dr. Sitoro will highlight in his presentation, a big, big scientific project that is going to be hosted in, in, in Botswana and Southern Africa. 
Um, I'm also engaging in committees regarding our liaison with uh, other countries, including South Africa. I uh, also serve in the Botswana Open Data Open Science Initiative that is meant to really spur ahead the discussions and, and, and exploitation of data uh, in Botswana. You can see the full list of things that we try to do all in the interest of trying to make sure that as academics, as researchers, we have our, our, our place uh, in the table. I don't want to spend too much time just to twist a little bit. I'm also a farmer. Um, I seem to be liked by animals wherever I go. Uh, top left corner days in Oxford, I met a couple of uh, animals that actually were gravitating towards me, uh, primarily because they could sniff out that I am, I am a farmer. So I thought maybe to, to highlight uh, the other side in terms of ourselves, I could say that. So about Botswana, I don't want to spend too much time. You all know about um, African countries, but it always amazes me how much we know about the history of Europe, the history of other countries, the history of other continents, and we hardly know about each other. So I wanted to put those slides in there to show what it is uh, that Botswana is about. And there are some very interesting facts about Botswana. Uh, there's the, the, the image uh, from space taken by the astronauts on the Expedition 40 crew passing over Botswana showing the Okobago Delta, if not the only inland delta at all, but definitely the biggest. You go to Okobango River instead of going to the ocean, traversing into the Kalahari Desert, forming a very, very vibrant ecosystem uh, that you can see there. Uh, I'm showing these things because they've got uh, imperatives in science. If you talk about uh, Earth observation, that's the first slide. If you talk about biodiversity, that's the second slide. These are issues that as, as African countries uh, we still are still lagging behind. I'm also showing you the the aerial view of both the Okobango and the Makali Kali pens, um, which are really very, very old salt, salt pens. They are bigger than Belgium. Uh, Botswana is quite large, the size of France. So those pens are very, 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 very vast. And incidentally, earlier this year, or late last year, it was, it was hypothesized that Botswana is the origin of humankind. And so this is a very strong hypothesis, and it's been, it's been, it's been um, captured in, in, in nature. Uh, a scientific uh, a publication. Um, you see there the very old rock paintings that uh, testimony to some of that hypothesis. Uh, Botswana produces uh, diamonds. Uh, we are the largest exporter of diamonds in the world. We've got very big mines. Uh, you can imagine areas like geophysics are very, very important uh, areas to us. I'm saying this because to provide context to some of the physicists who are in audience. There's a very big push to find the biggest, uh, the next biggest mines because we are primarily a mineral exporting country, even though we are the swell economy, there's a big push to use scientific methods of exploration uh, to really look for the next big mines. But I have to say, uh, Dr. Katevi and the audience, that Africa's gems are not underground, but in our people. There's a survey there that shows that the median age of Africa is 19. And look at the other continents, uh, ranging from 31 to late 40s. In fact, there's a simple animation that shows how the age will change over a period of time. You can see that it doesn't change very much. Africa is still youthful. I'm saying this because we need to really think about that competitive advantage, uh, both in advancing our economies, but also in developing pipelines uh, for innovation, for research, and, and for technology. To that end, us at University of Botswana are taking this very, very seriously. We've invested a lot uh, in our students. We've invested a lot in our infrastructure. I'm highlighting these things because there will be opportunities across the continent for mobility of postdocs, when you finish your PhDs to think about where you're gonna go next. Chances are that you need to, to stop looking just at Europe and at, at America, but also looking continental to see where you can come. So there's a bit of a slide about University of Botswana, uh, just for posterity, but also for providing uh, information. We do have some infrastructure, like I said, but when I came home, my interest was how do we make sure that this infrastructure is used to the fullest, not just for it to be buildings, but also uh, to really uh, provide us with the avenues for, for self-growth. So really, the next few slides, colleagues, are about maybe as at an African level, what is it that Africa is talking about? And how can we as scientists uh, really contribute to both the aspirations, the visions, and developmental agenda through science and technology? You'll be very, very aware of some of these documents. If not, I'll encourage uh, some of the young scientists here uh, to look at some of those documents because immersed in those documents are nuggets of information about priorities for Africa in terms of even research. If you are going to do a research project 
uh, you may also want to see how your research has impact on the ground. And it doesn't get better than really looking at the documents uh, at a continental level, at a national level, at a regional level, to be able to, uh, to align your research with the imperatives. There's also a bit of an issue regarding scientific uh, work in Africa, regarding collaboration, regarding the growth of the science enterprise. So that particular document that I'm sharing you shows you how research collaboration has been happening in the world. You can see from the period of 1996 to 2000, a study was done. You can see there's fairly very good uh, collaboration patterns in Europe and, and, and the US. Uh, those collaboration patterns intensified over time. And you can see that uh, there is a lot happening in those, in those continents. Uh, a similar picture for Africa is very sparse with obviously a number of centroids, maybe in South Africa and Nigeria and Kenya. That was in 1996, but we'll agree that it's still sparse compared to the previous picture. Uh, the situation kind of improved over time, uh, but you can see that there's still a lot of work uh, that could be done. So question is, how could we change that particular dispensation? How could we revert uh, to new ways of, of, of intervening to see how we can make the picture better to get Africa to take its place in the world competitively? in the use of science, technology, and innovation to really better our objectives. So I thought that would be a very, very good background to see where we are and maybe position ourselves to think about the next few presentations that I'll give, that we will give, uh, to show maybe, uh, demonstrate how the use of connected uh, ecosystems, research ecosystems through enabling infrastructure, the use of open data, the use of open science, how these things could be used to, to really move us further uh, as a continent. I'm putting that slide there just to give you context what the word cyber infrastructure means. Uh, Dr. Sitwell will take a few minutes uh, after uh, this presentation to really dig deeper. The idea of a cyber infrastructure is really to create this collaborative commons that connects uh, organizations uh, through high-speed networks and provide the necessary computational resources uh, to allow us to share data, uh, to allow us to share expertise, and to share very expensive instruments to make sure that we make the most of the little that we have. Um, so the proposal there is, can Africa look at developing these cyber infrastructures and what are we doing to date in developing these cyber infrastructures to take us to the next realm? So I think without further ado, uh, Dr. Ketevi, I'll invite Dr. Sitole uh, to take uh, where I left, uh, where I left off, to really talk us through um, what is happening uh, uh, in the region, what is happening in South Africa, and what could happen in Africa regarding uh, a potential uh, of cyber infrastructure and what is developed uh, uh, to date. Thank you very much. Dr. Sitol, are you, are you ready with your presentation, sir? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, let me just... Uh... So maybe uh, Chayamo, you can stop sharing. Yeah, good. Yes, I'll stop Excellent. sharing. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, sir. There we go. I think I got the. the can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, you can go to the full screen mode. Yeah, let me just uh, just swap, swap the screens around. Then I can just share on uh, another screen quickly. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, like um, what Siama has already indicated, uh, my name is uh, Happy Sitale, and I am responsible for the National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure um, in South Africa. We have got some programs that we are pursuing in the continent, 
So um, I will share with you some of those developments about the cyber infrastructure, where we are, what we are doing in the continent, and what we uh, aspire to achieve as, uh, as the continent. So basically, maybe just here, uh, for those of us um, uh, who don't know South Africa, um, this, is the, this is the map of South Africa here. And the map of South Africa, so we have got our center. Our center is in Cape Town. So Cape Town here, as you can see, that's a coastal area. And um, uh, at the, the far end of, of the country. So we have got beautiful views in Cape Town. You can see there the Table Mountain. And today, uh, the picture one we took, at least uh, the Table Mountain did not have any table cloth. So <laughs> the, for high performance computing, that's where it is. Uh, it's like a very uh, small building that uh, you won't think that that's where we put our computers. Uh, that's for strategic purpose. So it doesn't have to be really that visible. Um, and uh, that's how it looks like. And that's, uh, that's where we are. That's where we put our uh, high performance computing systems. Um, yes, I think that gives you a background about South Africa, where we are. And basically, we are providing computational resources for the whole country. So we have got a network that covers the whole country. And that network there is uh, provided by what we call the South African National Research Network. And uh, we have got also for long-term data exploration, we have an organization that is called the Data Intensive Research Infrastructure of South Africa or DIRISA. So this one looks uh, specifically in uh, providing uh, data services. And we have got, of course, the Center for High Performance Computing that provides uh, high performance computing systems. So the rationale behind this is that once people have got the computing, you need to have access and you need to have access to secure systems. So you need the network connectivity. You have got the computing, you've got large data, we have got what we call the high performance data analytics. So that you will need the computing, you will need the storage uh, capabilities. Sometimes we have got large data, for an example, a lot of people in bioinformatics that they want to move the data across. So we have got all those elements where you have got people who want to transfer large scale data. So hence our model in South Africa, is to have all these three entities managed under one. So in this way, we can ensure that, for an example, a client who's sitting here, who requires a lot of data, who has got uh, a lot of data that has to be moved, but also requires a lot of computing, this client can only just talk to one uh, entity, which is Nikis. And we have got those examples of those for an example, uh, Tiamo talked about the square kilometer array. The square kilometer array um, is uh, uh, the square kilometer array is a large scale science project uh, that is a multinational um, project um, from uh, Europe. Uh, we have got uh, uh, almost uh, many countries that are participating in this. And uh, the reason the project was uh, uh, put in South Africa is because we have got clear skies uh, in the Karoo where you can be able to listen to your radio very quietly. So for the telescopes like a radio astronomy, that was uh, the best choice. And, and this is a big uh, experiment that's taking place in South Africa and some of uh, the observations are done in Australia. Also around the Perth area where you have got a big desert there without uh, any uh, disturbance of radio um, frequencies. So 
those are some of the projects that are being driven by the cyber infrastructure. But also from the Large Hadron Collider, we are a tier two facility for SAN. So we provide the, the tier two facilities for SAN, and this is the only facility in the African continent that provides such services. And other examples are in bioinformatics, as I have already indicated, for, geom, uh, uh, for genomic sequencing. And we have got some of the examples in the 4IR, the fourth industrial revolution, that uh, many nations aspire to prepare themselves for. So those are some of the things that will require connectivity. It will require lots of data. It will require processing. So we have got examples of that. But the other part that we're looking at, we're not just looking at uh, South Africa as an individual country. We're looking at the entire continent. And as uh, Tiama has already indicated, we have got the South African, I mean, the, the SADC, uh, the Southern African Development Countries and the cyber infrastructure framework in there. Another part that I think that uh, Dr. Mary Jane Bopape is going to touch on is on the climate change. This is um, a concern for the rest of the world. And for you to be able to achieve those, you require the overall cyber infrastructure. You need a lot of computing. You need to be able to process and store a lot of data and you need to move it around to be able to do that. So those can only be possible through this model of nucleus. So our belief is that uh, uh, this is, should be uh, for the whole continent. And our vision is basically to make sure that uh, we have got a competitive nation and we harness uh, the knowledge-based uh, economy. And we provide this through innovation and share access to advanced cyber infrastructure and facilities. Uh, we talk also about services because we don't believe that you put the computing and the storage there, you need to be able to provide services. Services, and I will talk a little bit about some of those services. How do we do that? Uh, make sure that uh, the infrastructure that we provide is world-class and we enable research and innovation, as I indicated. Um, we do a lot interacting with uh, our society and we make sure that uh, everything that we provide is integrated. But also the other element that we don't um, um, ignore is to developing the human capital or developing uh, the workforce uh, for such uh, 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 new um, explorations. So those are some of the elements and our objectives, as you can see. The first objective is uh, make sure that we've got infrastructure and we do the enable and provide the science or overall uh, make sure that the research community have, can be able to use these facilities. So we've got a big program that's make sure that uh, we interact with the community. Um, one of the things, as I have already indicated, we want to position South Africa and the continent to take part in or host and lead large-scale uh, science projects. Um, and uh, lastly, as I indicated, uh, we provide uh, um, uh, human capital development. And um, um, on the SADC uh, framework or the SADC cyber infrastructure framework, one of the things that we work together with the countries uh, around SADC, and I will talk about also some of the countries uh, in Africa, which are not in SADC, is to help them build policies uh, for cyber infrastructure. Uh, we also help them to build computational resources, uh, ranging from HPC systems and, and the data tools. And what we are also working on now is to look at developing the national research networks or the NRAN around uh, the continent. And key to all these things is to make sure that we have got uh, the society that is enabled. So that basically encompasses our, our vision and, and, and our initiatives uh, in, in the continent. Uh, I will just give you uh, the status of where we are in terms of the infrastructure 
what you see here is the infrastructure that we have in South Africa. Um, uh, the machine, the computing capability is 1.6 uh, petaflops. And uh, with the storage that is attached to the computing, I know when I talk to the people in US, these are just uh, very small numbers, but it's very significant for Africa because this is a machine that provides a lot of computing resources for the continent. From the data intensive research, we have got the data storage and which uh, are based on the cloud portal and we can be able to interact with the researchers. This is based on the IROTs and we have got long-term storage. And in the meantime, we are busy working on long-term archival storage. So the belief is that you have got the computing, you produce the data, you should be able to store it temporarily. People interface with it. And at some point, you want to be able to store that data because you can't be able to reproduce it. So we look at the, the long-term archiving of uh, the data. And um, we also have got the, the network is covering the whole country. You can see here, the longest distance that you can travel in South Africa uh, from Cape Town, and we go all the way to the north. This is uh, towards the border of Zimbabwe. We have got the university there called the University of Venda. And we have got the researchers there that are doing a lot of work. And these researchers don't have to travel this road because that will be over 2,000 kilometers if they have to travel across to come to Cape Town to bring a disk of data. So you can see that our network is covering the whole country. And while we don't have uh, uh, the network that we can be able to get fiber across the country, we build our own. For an example here, that's a network that is going straight to Canovan, uh, to the SKA, and we're bringing the data from there, bringing it to our network. So this is a network that we're building for ourselves. So where you see the brown area, those are the areas that we build for our own. But also the network is covering the rest of the world. We have got the pipes that are moving on the west here, uh, the West Africa cable, and uh, also on this side on uh, the East Africa cable here that is landing in Durban. So that allows all the South African researchers to be able to move the data. And here we have got the two sides on the east and, Af and the west, so that uh, we also have got the redundancy. So uh, in this way, we don't get shut out when one of the cables is uh, having a problem. So that is the network. And at the moment, this network is 100 gig. You can see on the slide here is 10. I still have to update this because uh, we have just upgraded this network in December and it is now 100 gig across the country. So we can move huge amounts of data across the country. So in terms of the computing, uh, a lot in more CPU type of computing. And this uh, computer now, it is called Lengau Lengau. It's um, uh, a cheetah. And um, uh, we named this computer after our fastest uh, animals. So we try to name this with uh, our wildlife. And this is an x86 system. It's based on um, the Intel processors. And it has been running now for four years. Two more years, this computer, it will be retiring. We run our systems for six years. And uh, the next system, it will be deployed uh, very soon. We are in a process of designing and working together on defining what type of a system will it get. As you can see, it's um, world class, uh, has been on the top 500. Uh, it has uh, moved out because now the world has moved on now. Um, US was number one at some point, but now Japan is number one in the top 500. So a lot is happening up there, but we are gradually working our way back on the top 500. But uh, one thing for sure is that whatever that we put, we want to make sure that it is world class. And besides the x86, we also uh, put on the GPUs because of 
some of the applications like uh, AI and machine learning, we found that they perform better on GPUs. So we also have got the GPU farm uh, that mainly is being used by the chemistry users, but uh, we also see a lot from the big data analytics and also machine learning on, on, on GPUs. So these systems are heavily utilized. We will see that mainly it's uh, our academic uh, people, 72%, uh, but we also have got the African SKA partners, like countries like Ghana, uh, Kenya, and the other uh, southern countries that are using this system. We have got the industry also, which is private sector. And the reason we also provide uh, the resources for the private sector is to make sure that our private sector can be competitive. So we want to make sure that their systems can work well. We work together with them. And also we have got the South African public. These are more the research sectors. So it's uh, the industries which are funded by government. So this will be research uh, uh, centers like state-owned enterprises. So that also use um, our systems. Uh, on the other side is just uh, the million hours uh, per core um, that are being used. Um, you can see here, these are all the universities in South Africa. So basically all these universities, uh, you can see this is University of Cape Town, this is Stellenbosch, University of Pazulu Natal. So these are all the universities. We have got 26 universities around the country and all these universities have got access. So the system is designed to make sure that uh, we have got a fair share. If you are sitting in a US, this will be different. Uh, you have got uh, a number of systems under the National Science Foundation. Uh, you have got also systems under the Department of Energy. Um, so you won't have all the universities on one system. So you can spread across uh, the, the, the country. In our case, we have got just one large system that covers for all these universities. Of course, we have got some smaller clusters um, in different institutions where we also uh, encourage the universities to build these smaller clusters so they can be able to be used for pre-processing and post-processing. But uh, the largest system is accessed by, by all these institutions, including our SADC countries and also um, uh, for an example, our industries. These are all like uh, the state-owned entities like your uh, CSIR, the South African Weather Services is one of the big users. I think that uh, Mary Jane will talk about that. I won't say anything about it, but basically these are all state-owned enterprises. You can see here in the continent for the African partner countries, these are the countries that take part on the SKA. You see here Kenya, you see Ghana, Mozambique, Namibia. The reason you don't see Botswana here is that the system that we deployed in Botswana is working so well and it's uh, covering for the, uh, <laughs> the community in Botswana. Not that I'm buying Siamo's face, but <laughs> that's the truth. So um, these are just some of the industries that I was talking about various industries, our mining industries. Uh, here is uh, your uh, precious metals, uh, Johnson Matthew, uh, diamond mining. You see a lot of engineering uh, industries that use uh, our system. So basically that covers the whole of those user groups. So I talked about our roadmap because uh, at the moment, um, as I have said, in terms of the network, I said we were on 10 gigs, and at the moment this has been upgraded now to 100 gig. So this is our roadmap, and in terms of the storage, we are building now the long-term archiving storage, uh, which will be a 40 petabytes plus uh, for access by our users. And for the computing in this case, uh, we are looking around 2021, 2022, we will be putting 10 petaflops and above that uh, will be driving our system. But in the middle, we are working with smaller upgrades. Like uh, I showed you the GPU, 
but we keep on having proof of concept for systems. So for new uh, processor developments, like at the moment now, a lot of uh, processor architecture is changing. We have seen that the Intel has been driven or woken up by AMD's resurgence. And there's uh, quite a lot that is happening. Currently, the first uh, system now on the top 500 in Japan, it is not based on the normal processors that we know. It is based on an ARM processor. And this has been a lot of development. So the processor technology is changing. And uh, at the moment, the exaflop machines or the exascales machine that are going to be built, uh, you will see that uh, they are looking at uh, a combination of all these uh, different architecture. So this is something that we are also looking at, but we're not just building the system because we like it. We want to make sure that it works for our user community. And as we have seen, whatever system that we build, it has to cover the users from all these universities. It has to cover the users from all these countries. So we do a lot of the benchmarks. We're not just pushing on making sure that our benchmark is the fastest computer. Can it be able to carry all these workloads um, coming from uh, the whole continent? So that is our philosophy in building our systems. And I talked about uh, the, the encouragement to make sure that we have got the systems, as much as we have got a big system, we want people to be able to have any access on this. So we have got what we call the High Performance Computing uh, Ecosystem Initiative. And in this, we are developing the high performance computing capabilities in South Africa. And here we work mainly with uh, previously disadvantaged institutions that could not afford the high performance computing system. We have been working with our friends in the US, for an example, the Texas Advanced Computing. Uh, in our case, we run a computer for six years, but I know that uh, in the US and Europe, the computer will run for three years and they are ready to retire that computer. So three years, the computer still have got a lot of life on it. So basically like uh, uh, for, for those of you in the US, you know that there used to be a computer called Ranger uh, in Texas and, and after that there was Stampede. When those computers were retired, we got some of those racks from uh, Texas. We took these computers, we repurposed them, and we used that to provide infrastructure. Similarly, the computers that come from our data center, when we um, upgrade, we take those computers, we provide to the community. So that helps us to be able to meet these objectives, like provide infrastructure, uh, to historically disadvantaged institutions. But the main thing is that we're developing a lot of skills um, and, and, and some also start building up research programs out of there. So we have the institutions to start research programs, develop the skills. And this we are not doing only for South African institutions. We're also doing that for SADC, as I have already indicated with countries like Botswana. But uh, we also develop also the HPC um, and a big data initiative for uh, the square kilometer array partner countries to make sure that uh, the countries that participate in this program are not just sitting there as spectators. They will have the workforce that will ensure that they truly participate in the experiment. They have got the skills to be able to process the data that will be coming from their countries so that they don't ship out just the data from there. People just capturing the images and just going. They could be able to add some value. So that, does the, that, that is the main reason for that. As you can see already, we have worked with these countries uh, around the, the continent, like you see there, Mauritius, uh, Namibia, Botswana, uh, Zambia. In all these countries, we have provided them with infrastructure. We have trained system administrators in this country. So basically, they can be able to put together this computer. 
which is the first thing that we really want. We need to have system administrators who understand uh, this system. So that's um, one of the key goals. And some of the countries uh, through their own initiatives like Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Eswatini, and Lesotho, we have got engagements going on there, but also the building capacity in this country. You can see this is uh, one of the Ranger machines. It has been repurposed, and this is uh, at the University of Botswana. So they've got a Ranger, but this site is uh, the rack of uh, Stampede. So they have got different architectures um, in the data center. This is uh, a flashy uh, data center in Zimbabwe. Uh, this was built with uh, INSPE, and you can see here, this is the computing, the HPC system uh, that is running there in Zimbabwe. So there is a lot of uh, HPC systems uh, in the continent. And you can see here the workshops. These are all system administrator scientists. And here they were on the training when they visited, uh, um, they were coming for the supercomputing conference. I think if you, you are very good, uh, you've got good eyes, not like mine, you can spot Siamo there. He's uh, one of those, uh, the people who are here. And um, we have got all the system administrators, engineers, uh, they were visiting tech. Here also, um, we had a special session in Denver. And um, in that special session, we're looking at how do we protect this uh, cyber infrastructure? And we had like uh, the team there uh, spend a week. They were talking about understanding risks in shared cyber ecosystem. So here, uh, the special focus was just on, on security. I think this was uh, a picture taken uh, somewhere just uh, in South Africa here uh, after talking about the SADC cyber infrastructure. So we've got men and women who are working around the, uh, all these concepts. I just want to take you quickly through some of the things that are being done. I'm not going to dwell deep into them, but you can just have a look for an example. This is just one of the example of the high performance computing. Um, and, and it is an example of uh, the mineral processing technology. And here is the redefinition of the uh, DC arc furnace. And in this case, this is the furnace, how it looks like. And you can see here, this is the actual image of the furnace. And this is the simulation that uh, the mineral processing industry is using. Here we have got the diamonds uh, in the seabed. And when uh, this, uh, the, the diamonds, you um, separate in the diamonds, because now you're coming from the seabed, there are some challenges you could be picking up shells and they almost have got similar uh, properties as the diamonds, so you might be picking up shells instead of uh, diamonds. So this is uh, one of uh, the systems that is being used and using computational fluid dynamics uh, so that you can be able to effectively be able to separate the diamonds in there. One good example again here, if you can look here, this was a design of a building in Port Elizabeth. Uh, Port Elizabeth is one of the windy cities. So if you try and build a house there, um, uh, you will struggle. You have to make sure that you position your house properly. You need to know the wind directions. And uh, so you have to do a lot of fluid dynamics to build a house. So this was a big building, which was being put by one of uh, our state owned companies. Transnet, and they wanted to build a building that they will be able to open windows from there. So they had to do a lot of fluid dynamics on there. And so it's uh, all sort of uh, examples that you can have. We do have now high speed trains, and some of uh, that uh, is being used uh, for the high speed train uh, studies, uh, our University of Pretoria. And here, when we designed our SKA dish to look at the, the electromagnetic interference and how the dish should look like. So a lot of design went in there to do the electromagnetic uh, uh, simulation. So 
This just gives you a wide range of areas that high performance computing can do. Uh, for an example, this is one example. We've got a lot of cold fire power stations around the Mpumalanga area. And this is a study that is looking at the air quality. And it is looking at the air quality around uh, the power stations. And as we can see, you will see the red mainly around um, the areas where there are the power stations. So just uh, one example of the study. I talked about um, human capital development. All these things we believe uh, we have to start building our workforce. And uh, we started in 2013. We training students from undergraduate uh, to start building high performance computing clusters. And uh, this is what we call the student cluster challenge. And uh, US also participates uh, in this area. And I can tell you that uh, in, from 2013, the, the students from South Africa, from different institutions, different students every year, as you can see, uh, they participated in that and winning uh, this title. This was the first time we sent these students. So we do have got the right skills if we give them exposure. So at the moment, uh, this program here, we are busy uh, looking at um, expanding it to the rest of the continent because we believe that there are more skills out there. You can see over from 2013, 2020, this was the first time we did this competition virtually. virtually and um, the Chinese were hosting the computer, but we narrowly beat the Chinese on this one. So we came second, but um, this was a very good performance also from the South African student. So um, this is just uh, uh, some of the work that we are doing. I hope that uh, gives you an idea of uh, the activities which are here on the continent in building the infrastructure and the skills and what do we use the cyber infrastructure for? Thank you very much for your attention and also for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, the developments of cyber infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sitola, for that um, uh, elaborate uh, treatment of, of the subject of developing uh, the cyber infrastructure. Uh, I'm glad that you, you mentioned that the cyber infrastructure has got the physical side of things, i.e. the compute platforms, mm -hmm. ranging all the way to the supercomputers that we can develop. Um, it's connected through a fabric of very high-speed networks with high bandwidth across countries and across uh, uh, the continent. Uh, we also see that the cyber infrastructure has to store data uh, regarding the use of repositories, and we know we hear that uh, the, the cyber infrastructure is, has a component of human capital. So really it's a number of components that the word cyber infrastructure uh, encapsulates. Dr. Ketebi, I think at this juncture, I, I, want to, I wish to bring in uh, Dr. Simon Hudson uh, from Codacta to maybe look at, at the data side of things, especially how Codata is engaging in Africa and in the world regarding the issues of, of, of data. Uh, and how perhaps uh, maybe going forward, some of the delegates who are in attendance today uh, can maybe see how they can link up with some of the activities that Kodata is doing uh, uh, going forward. Dr. Hudson, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tsiyama. Um, I trust you can, people can hear me, can see uh, the video and can see my screen, which I think I'm sharing. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much to Tsiyama for the invitation for the excellent introduction, which I thought was fantastic. And thank you to Happy for that very comprehensive overview of cyber infrastructure activities in Africa. In what I'm going to say, I'm going to follow on a little bit from Happy's presentation. Happy talked about a lot of the cyber infrastructure and the human capital. And I'm going to put quite a lot of emphasis upon what we do to the data to make it as usable as possible. So I'm going to talk about two key concepts, open science, which is about the availability of data, and I'll explain a little bit about that, and about fair data. 
these are these principles that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'll flesh that out a little bit. But in this brief introduction to, to the themes, I'm trying to make the point that this follows on from what Happy has been saying, because we've got the infrastructure, we've got the pipes, we've got the compute, we've got the human capital, and we've got their application in science projects. But to make as much as possible out of scientific activities, out of research, and to make those data as usable as possible, to get the greatest value out of them for science, we need to think about how the data are described, what additional information comes with those data such that they can be used. So, okay. Following Selma's lead, I'm going to say very little about um, myself and the organization um, that I manage. So I'm the executive director of CoData. CoData is based in Paris, in France, and I've lived here for the last seven years. Um, and I very much consider myself a citizen of the world. I've lived for two years um, as a postdoc in Canada, in Quebec, in the French speaking part of Canada. I lived for six months in Mexico, Mexico City. And I also studied as a, as a student for two years in Paris and coming back to Paris was one of, um, was one of my ambitions for my professional life. I was also born in Kenya, in Katale, in the Western uh, re region of Kenya. And that's because my parents were teaching. Um, they're teaching in a um, Kamasinger, uh Boys' school, um, and the, as part of a scheme called uh, voluntary service overseas, which was, which, which, which was, which was then then running. So I grew up, or I, the early part of my life, I spent, I spent in in Kenya, and I've worked a lot as part of my role in in CoData with African data projects, as part of the pilot project for the African Open Science Platform, and I'll talk a little about, about that later. So the organization I run, CoData, the full title is the Committee on Data of the International Science Council, but it's not really a committee. It's more than a committee. It's a not-for-profit international membership organization. And CoData's members include um, national data committees, national organizations, scientific academies, international scientific unions. So those organizations that represent particular disciplines globally. So in the domain, I think that a lot of you come from, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics um, is, is an international organization that represents that subject area um, globally. And CoData's mission is to connect data and people to advance science and improve the world. And we support our parent organization, the International Science Council. We support their mission of advancing science as a global public good by addressing issues relating to data. And we see data as the foundation, if you like, for good scientific um, work and practice. CoData, as part of our strategy, we have four key areas of activity. We do a lot of work on data policies and principles, so advocating good practice in, re in relation to data, advocating open data, open science, and doing reports of organizations, sometimes assessments of organizations and their contribution to science and to um, data availability. So we recently did a review of GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. We do a lot of work with data science, so we have task groups and working groups that address particular technical issues relating to data. We have a data science journal, and sometimes as CoData alone, sometimes with other organizations, we run regular uh, conferences. Um, and Siamo has already mentioned International Data Week 2018, um, which took place in Haberone um, in Botswana in, in, in November of that year. We do a lot of work on human capital, um, similar to, to what Happy was talking about. So we have training activities, training workshops, training schools, and we do a lot of work on trying to define 
the data science curriculum as well so that those training materials and those ideas about what it is we need to inculcate in students and, um, and early career researchers in relation to data uh, can be generalized. And then finally, we do a lot of work on what we consider strategic programs to improve the way that data can, can be but combined across domains for particular research outcomes. And I'll say a little bit about that. So this uh, seminar, I understand speaking to the African Society of, 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 of Physics, I wanted to mention one very long standing activity that CoData has been, um, has, has overseen. And it's possibly one of the things that CoData is best known for. So since 1969, CoData has um, had as part of its activities um, the task group on fundamental physical constants. And it's that group that reviews the data from many sources relating to specific fundamental physical constants, like the Planck, the Planck constants, the elementary charge of Boltzmann constant, etc. So already those codata recommended values were extremely important in many areas of science and in physics in particular. More recently, in 2018, the, um, the International Con Conference of the Bureau International des Poids Mesures, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, agreed a major revision of the SI units and agreed that these would now be entirely based upon the recommended, the code data recommended values for those fundamental physical constants. Uh, such that the, um, the, the kilogram is no longer based upon this physical kilogram, which used to be held in a vault um, just outside Paris, but is now derived mathematically from the Planck constants. So I think that's a very considerable contribution to science, to metrology, um, etc. And hopefully that's um, of interest and significance. Related to that, and also of interest to um, physics, um, is another task group that we have called DRUM. Um, it's the Digital Representation of Units of Measure. And that's, again, a collaborative activity involving a number of stakeholders. There is, at the moment, an initiative, again, led by the International uh, Bureau of Weights and Measures, um, to define the digital SI. So this is the digital representation of the SI units. And this CoData task group aims to reinforce and to collaborate with that initiative um, in order that those digital representations should be as accessible as possible and that they should include conversions for non-SI units and that they should be digital, digitally referenceable. And in that initiative, we should also include other types of units and their representation and the measures associated with them from a variety of, of, of research areas. And the objective of this overall is that when scientists, when researchers are referencing the things they have measured, the things that they have observed, it should be easier for them in their code, in their databases, to reference unambiguously the particular definition of a unit for which they have a specific measure or observation. And that's very important for, obviously, for the interoperability of data within a particular domain or even across domains. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, although I'm very grateful for the invitation from Tiama, I have to admit this is coming to the end of the day and I'm exhausted because this afternoon I spent four hours on a um, on a call with yeah. the um, international advisory group which is working on a UNESCO recommendation on open science so there's an important activity at the moment being led by UNESCO and coordinated by UNESCO to prepare a UNESCO recommendation on open science now, what that means, that's a policy document 
and it's regarded as um, soft law, a form of policy guidance for UNESCO member states. So when finally in November 2021 that will be approved, then countries that are members of UNESCO will be not necessarily obliged, but will be advised to take into account in their policy, in their strategies, and to some extent in their legislation, the recommendation from UNESCO regarding open science. Um, so there's a strong encouragement and the UNESCO process means also that there will be some follow-up, that, um, that there will be targets and a mechanism by which um, countries will be asked to report on their progress um, in relation to the UNESCO recommendation on open science. That recommendation, once we finish the drafting this evening and tomorrow, that will go to um, internally within UNESCO, and then it will be published um, at the beginning of October for further consultation with UNESCO member states and with the scientific community. And so there will be an opportunity for, scientific, for, for scientists and for, for member states to comment further on that recommendation until January 2021, and then it will go back into the UNESCO system. Um, it'll be published and, and, and uh, further worked on um, ne next, next year in 2021 until a final version is, um, is, is developed. If you're interested in these ideas, um, there was a consultation, an online consultation um, earlier this year, and Codeca coordinated a submission to that consultation, and the, um, the, that document is linked there, and that gives some indication of the sort of issues that we're concerned with in that activity. <clears throat> so hopefully that's of interest and, and reinforces this idea that there is a contemporary movement towards open science because there's a recognition that with on the one hand the opportunities we have with 21st century technologies and on the other hand the challenges we have that science needs to address that we have a need for open science we have a need for the results of scientific research to be more accessible, for the data that underpins those results to be accessible and reusable, and for them to be testable, for us to be able to scrutinize the conclusions um, of other scientists more effectively, and for us to be able to reuse and transform and repurpose the code or the data that might be, might be involved. So though that cluster of ideas fit into, fits into this idea of, of, of open, open science. I'll just go through some of those key ideas. You can see that open science here is a, um, is a, a construct of, of a number of different um, components, including open access, including open data, including open source software, et cetera. Um, but stepping back a little bit to principles, we also argue that if science is a global public good, then open science is something which aims to maximize the benefit of society of science for society. And it aims to advance this fundamental principle of scientific reproducibility, that we should be able to access the data and the evidence upon which scientific conclusions rest and to scrutinize um, those conclusions. And, and, and that evidence. We often have to remind people as well that open science does not necessarily mean unrestricted openness. Um, it explicitly allows certain necessary and proportionate protections of data. For example, for personal data, data relating to endangered species, some commercial issues, some security issues, etc. And so what we say is that open science means open by default. So unless there's a good reason for protecting the data and protecting the code or the other components of the scientific enterprise, then these things should be open. And another way, another way of putting that is as open as possible and as close as necessary. 
And so this means in the context of the, UN rec uh, the UNESCO recommendation that we encourage the adoption of open science frameworks, which include these supporting uh, principles that I've just mentioned. And so now I want to move on to another component of open science, which is the FAIR principles. Now, the FAIR principles came about as, in some ways, the, uh, the cumulative effect of this recognition that it's not enough to make data open or code open if those things, those data or the, that, that code is unusable, if it's not documented, if we don't know how the data were collected, what they refer to and what they mean. What's the, you know, how can we, how can we use that? So this is a guide of core principles to make data as usable as possible to give it as, as, um, uh, as much value as possible. So these principles that the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And the reference is there for the, for the original article that presented um, these, um, these principles of which the, the president um, of Codata, Baron Mons, was, was, one of the key, was one of the key authors. Here are the guiding principles themselves taken from the article. They're just there for, for reference. Um, and I'll give a, a little bit of a gloss of what those, those principles mean. Um, and reference there is um, a report for the, um, for the European Union, which I was involved, uh, I was the chair of, that, of the expert group that produced that report, which produced a roadmap of how to implement the FAIR principles. What supporting te technical infrastructure and human infrastructure, human capital is necessary to make FAIR a reality. What does FAIR mean? To be findable that the data and other digital objects produced by research should have sufficiently rich metadata and a universe um, and unambiguous identifier to enable uh, discovery. Um, that the data should be accessible, not just by humans, but also by machines, by algorithms. It allows programmatic access for analysis. And then these further two ideas, which are particularly important and a lot harder to achieve, that the data should be interoperable. That means that when we're doing our research and analysis, that it's easier for us to combine different data sets, that we understand what has been measured, what has been observed, and what we need to do in order to combine this data set with another data set. And of course, reusable, that we have sufficient access information, we have the license, but above all the provenance information. How were the data created? What are they a representation of? And what transformations have those data been through so that we can understand exactly how those can be, be used? And these are very um, important, important ideas. These ideas come together in a project which um, I mentioned that I was involved with for the, for, the, um, for the last few years, a pilot project to put in place um, a plan and a strategy to develop an, a collaborative Pan-African open science platform. So this was a, um, a three-year pilot. It was funded by um, DSP and NRF in South Africa. Um, the project team was based at the, um, the Academy of Sciences of South Africa and with oversight from CODATA and indeed from the International Science Council. We did a lot of work on advocacy and community building. There was an excellent landscape survey of open science and data initiatives in Africa. And we developed a framework document which was condensed into this vision and strategy document which is referenced there. And this is a relatively short read. It's about 12 pages. I strongly recommend this to any participant who's interested in understanding what open science is, how it can be transformative, what the case for open science in Africa is, 
and also a presentation of a strategy for a, a Pan-African initiative that can achieve a considerable acceleration towards um, open science. And so we presented in that strategy document uh, six key areas of activity which we felt were important. Um, the need for a federated network and cloud facilities, and Happy has spoken to, to some extent to that. The need, on the other hand, for open science of FAIR and research data management tools, which, so that's, you know, on the one hand, you have the infrastructure side, on the other hand, you have the data and the tools side. Then bringing that together with advanced institutes in data science and artificial intelligence, and then applying that specifically to interdisciplinary research projects. Building a community network of skills, because without the human capital, you can't achieve this. And then six, the sixth part of the strategy is this importance of societal engagement and participation. And it's important that science, open science be recognized as something that's not just for scientists, but also engages with society and global challenges. I'll say a little bit about that. Um, Siamo, I just want to check. I've added a, um, a handful of slides on this and I'll try and go through them quite yeah. quickly. I just want to check with you that I've got enough time to do that. Yeah, go ahead and uh, provide okay. information. Thank you. Okay, so I want to speak um, a little bit to um, interdisciplinary global challenge projects and how we take those forward. Because part of our challenge um, in global science and also I think the challenge for the African Open Science Platform are precisely these cross-domain global challenges. And I'll say a little bit about what I, what I mean by that. <clears throat> so as I've mentioned, CODATE is part of the International Science Council and the International Science Council developed a new science action plan. And this was partly because the International Science Council was formed um, from the fusion of a previous organization that looked after the natural sciences and another organization that looked after the social sciences. So this new organization, the International Science Council, brought together these two sides of the way we understand the world, the natural sciences and the social sciences. And there's a very good reason for that in that the major global challenges that we face, whether that's climate change and climate change adaptation, whether that's disaster risk reduction, whether that's the growth of cities, whether that's biodiversity and land use and agriculture, depend upon research and data from the natural sciences, but also research and data from the social sciences, because we can't solve these problems unless we address human and societal challenges as well. So that, those circumstances, this new organization, the International Science Council, led to the development of this science action plan. And one of the main topics of the science action plan is open science and 21st century challenges with data. So CODATA was asked to prepare a particular initiative as part of that science action plan to address the issues of how we combine data across domains. There's a very good reason for that in that we argue at the moment that the potential of research is currently not sufficiently achieved because we spend too much time trying to access data, trying to find data or to create the data and trying to combine data from different sources. There's a report for the European Commission from PricewaterhouseCoopers or PwC as then uh, known now, which estimates on the basis of questionnaires and interviews with a number of major projects in, in the European research area that at least 80% of project effort is used on data wrangling. And often we think that's actually probably a quite conservative uh, estimate. And they estimate that there's a 10.2 billion euro opportunity cost in the European research area from as a result of suboptimal data stewardship. So there's a major reason for us wanting to address this. So as I've said, data for global grid and challenges, um, our, we see our role as co-data in supporting the International Science Council and these major programs which are sponsored by the International Science Council. You may have heard of Future Earth, Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, Urban Health and Wellbeing. Each of these areas address major, major global challenges and each of them are 
cross-disciplinary. They need data from many different sources. So how can we make sure that the data is as fair as possible and above all, interoperable and reusable? So we've been designing a global program with three components. On the one hand, working with particular domains, that's number two on the diagram there, um, to understand how um, researchers in physics or geography or social sciences look after the data and what standards or specifications they have for data description, how they classify the concepts and how they agree on shared concepts. Trying to apply that um, and developing interoperability and reusability for cross-domain case studies, for example, in resilient cities and disaster risk reduction in infectious diseases, and then pulling this together in a series of technical um, and practical recommendations and good practice and consensus around terminologies, ontologies, metadata, and the application of uh, machine learning. So this is a program in, in, in design, but I think it um, complements what um, Siamo and uh, Happy have said about um, cyber infrastructure and collaboration um, across the, the, the continent. We have a set of initial working groups, one looking at digital units of measure, which I've mentioned, one looking at semantic interoperability and our general recommendations for how we look after semantic resources. We're collaborating a lot with um, an organization called uh, DDI, it's the Data Documentation Initiative, and they've produced a metadata specification called cross-domain integration, which is designed to assist um, and to work over different data sets to assist um, how we can combine data sets from different sources. Um, we're looking at case studies in terms of policy monitoring, so the sustainable development goals, the Sendai um, framework for reporting disaster loss, um, and we've got um, projects that are in development in the area of infectious disease um, and in resilient and health assistance. The infectious disease one is very interesting. We're working with a number of projects who um, are looking at the combination of long-term large corpus social science data, and a lot of that in, in African institutions, and combining that with um, clinical data relating to HIV. What has been learned from those initiatives about how we combine the data, we also now want to apply in um, projects relating to um, the current pandemic of, um, of COVID. Um, and those projects are in, in the process of, of, being, of being established. Recently, and for the next few months as well, we've been running a series of webinars um, relating to this, this metadata specification cross-domain integration. And we've been giving an introduction to that specification, but also exploring how it can be used for particular domains and how it can be used for particular cross-domain um, case studies. And that webinar series and those series of online workshops is going to continue for the next two to three months. Um, and that may be of interest if people are interested in interoperability and the use of um, metadata. Um, and these last two slides, I'm going to skip over a little bit, but they're there for information. We're in the process of setting up um, this um, this program, looking for funding, looking for partners. Um, we've got some pilot projects and some funding on the way. Um, and our objective is to be able to announce the launch of the program at the International Science Council's General Assembly um, in Oman in October 2021. Um, so we've got a lot of work between now and then, but hopefully that's of interest um, in understanding how um, global collaboration can help us address some of the issues of interoperability and reusability of data. Um, so those are the two key messages that I want to, wanted to talk about. Open science and that definition and what's going on in the world at the moment about open science and particularly the UNESCO recommendation, the importance of the FAIR principles as a set of guiding principles for how we make data work better together and um, the CoData program on um, uh, making data work for cross-domain grand challenges which in, in partnership with the African Open Science Platform, we think will be a, a significant contribution. For the last few slides, I'm going to, um, these are here mostly for reference and of interest, but I'm going to go through these very quickly to 
indicate some of the other activities that, um, that CoData does. Um, I mentioned in the introductory slide that we do a lot of work on training and education. There's this ongoing series of schools, the CoData RDA Schools of Research Data Science. They deliver a two-week um, course in foundational data skills. Um, the motivation being, these are the skills which we think that all researchers need in whatever domain. Um, they've been an extremely successful initiative. We started with um, a series of, uh, of schools at the ICTP in Trieste in Italy, and then it's expanded to other locations. Of course, in 2020, in the year of the pandemic, um, we ran, uh, or the team ran a school and the, in January in Pretoria, and then subsequently to that, obviously, we've not been able to run face-to-face -face schools. But as I speak, last week and this week, um, the, the team have been running a virtual school, um, largely for alumni, um, going through the curriculum and trying to improve the curriculum and train people for um, to, to return as helpers. And we hope that once the pandemic is open, this, the face-to-face -face schools will be able to happen again. Um, CoData has also done other training activities. We have a regular series of uh, schools, of uh, training workshops hosted in Beijing. Um, and we've done training workshops along a similar model um, in various locations as well. And there's been a sort of cross fertilization between the curriculum, um, which really came out of, um, which was developed by some of our colleagues in, in China and the um, curriculum used in the data schools. There's been cross fertilization within those and now those curricula um, are, very, are very aligned. And we hope there'll be more in 2021. And um, if participants track the CoData website or sign up to the CoData lists or social media, then hopefully you'll hear about um, the next events. We've got an early career and alumni group. Um, at the moment, that's led by Charlie Gadley from India and Felix um, Anyam from Nigeria. They're both alumni of the data schools. Um, they've both attended um, data schools as students and then gone back as helpers. And then they organized their own um, school on Urban Data at Shadi's in Institute in, in India. Um, and then this year we um, gave them some resource and some support um, to uh, set up this CoData to Connect group, this early career and alumni group. And they've done fantastic things. They've done us with colleagues. It's not just the two of them, but the two of them are the leads. They've done a series of webinars on resilient cities, a webinar series on research skills, um, an essay competition, and they're preparing a set of podcasts. Um, they're doing fantastic stuff and we want to expand that activity um, to appeal for, for new members and in November 2021 at our next General Assembly we'll change the leadership as well. Um, but that's been fantastic work. I mentioned the Data Science Journal. Um, so it's at datascience.codata.org. It's fully open, uh, fully open access and it's been extremely um, uh, successful in, in recent years. It's now um, listed on uh, Web of Science and Scopus and the impact factor has been rising, though we shouldn't pay too much attention to that. But it is some indication of the success and the focus of, um, of the Data Science Journal as an open access um, place for people to discuss issues around data science. Last two slides. Um, and I realize that my, my apologies, this is an old slide. This is out of date. Um, these dates are wrong. I am very sorry I took this from a little slide deck. Um, we're running in December. So 30, So please ignore the dates that are given on this side. It's the 30th of November to the 4th of December, the Fair Convergence Symposium. It is entirely online. We had hoped for a while that we would run it as a hybrid event, some in-person participation in Paris and other um, and virtual participation. We've changed our minds about that. It's entirely online and it's free to attend. Um, and the call for sessions is still open. Because of the change of date and the change of format, we extended um, the deadline for the, um, uh, for, the, uh, for the session submissions to the 30th of September. So if you're interested in submitting a session, the deadline is still open. If you're interested in participating, participation is free between the 30th of November and the 4th of December. But we do um, urge that you register as soon as possible because we're concerned that um, uh, we might uh, reach capacity. And then to 
close this presentation, um, I mentioned International Data Week 2018 in Botswana, in, um, in, in Haberoni in Botswana. The next edition of International Data Week, we delayed a, a year, will be in November 2021 in Seoul in South Korea. To follow Codata activities, our website and our blog is there. We have a very active um, discussion list where, which is often the best resource for a lot of our announcements. Um, and we also run, and is run largely by Felix and his colleagues in the Codata Connect, um, a data science and data stewardship careers list, um, which you can sign up to. We're, we're on Twitter and on other social media channels, and that's how to stay in touch with, with our opportunities for training activities or for participation in, in the other activities that I mentioned. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and my apologies that I um, hadn't cor corrected and updated that slide about the symposium. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, uh, for that um, very, very detailed presentation. And I, I have to apologize uh, to you for yanking you out of a very, very long day from the UNESCO meeting <laughs> and providing um, a, a rich set of slides. And I'm sure the delegates can see the links in your slides. Uh, they can see the initiatives going on. And most importantly, the, the training that have been, uh, been, been, been arranged by Cordata and RDA over the past couple of years. I have some of my students in attendance who've been um, to Italy to Trieste. Uh, to take the RDA uh, Cordata summer school and they're actually attending the virtual one and you're mm -hmm. pushing for to, to do what uh, Felix and the others are doing. I think this is exemplary. Uh, a lot of some of the delegates who are young scientists here can provide that leadership uh, in their institutions. So we really thank you for that uh, because you tend to look it's at the science and we write papers. Where is the data? What about the producibility? Where is the data that you produce from your dissertation? Where is the data that you collected on your experiments? Can somebody reproduce your results scientifically uh, to make sure that there is, uh, there is reproducibility? I think the issues you touched upon are very, very important in something that young scientists uh, and, and early career researchers need to appreciate. So we, we appreciate you for, uh, for that presentation. Uh, colleagues, in the remaining time, uh, we thought we'd put this together by inviting a scientist who is actually working uh, 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 in, in, in a regional project, a project that uh, involves a number of uh, institutions. It involves, in this particular instance, uh, meteorological services in Southern Africa. Uh, meteorological services in Southern Africa are, in, are working together uh, uh, through a project to really exercise the cyber infrastructure that Dr. Sito was talking about. I thought, we thought this would be a very useful uh, illustration uh, regarding the issue that I raised earlier. How can we collaborate? How can we use the cyber infrastructure to collaborate? What are the issues, for example, regarding data? What are the issues regarding sharing instruments? What are the issues regarding uh, cross-border collaboration? So I thought for the interest of the scientists, uh, the young scientists who are here, who may be uh, interested in atmospheric physics, interested in met metrology, interested in modeling, uh, may find this particular talk very, very uh, useful. So at this stage, I would like to invite Dr. Mirjain Bopape, who is a chief scientist at the Weather Service in South Africa, who's coordinating this project to really spend this time that is left uh, to, 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 to discuss with us what they're doing and what their experiences are in, in fostering this African collaboration. Over to you, Dr. Bopape.